Hi, I'm happy to introduce uh, Eric Ratchlin. Um, Eric is currently the CTO at Body Labs, which he co-founded in 2013. Eric graduated Brown in 2003 with an SCB in Applied Math CS. His senior year, he was a head TA of CS51 with John, and the following year, they began working together on modeling emergent stochastic assembly techniques for manufacturing nanoscale computing devices. After competing, competing, completing a PhD with John in 2010, Eric became Michael Black's postdoc, and in 2011, he and the entire team transitioned to the Max Planck Institute of Intelligent Systems. At MPI, Eric was a senior research scientist working on creating accurate 3D models of human shape from both 2D and 3D data. Eric. Thank you. All right. And I was also Eugene's neighbor for a couple of years in, uh, during my PhD. Uh, so hi, I'm Eric. As just said, I'm the CTO and uh, co-founder of Body Labs. I'll certainly talk a bit about the work we do there. Um, I also uh, was a senior research scientist at MPI, and before that, uh, from 1999 to 2011, spanning three decades, I was at Brown. It's a postdoc, PhD, master's, undergrad. Uh, between undergrad and master's, I was doing some work for John. John, I looked myself up in the directory at one point. I, my official status then was a Class F employee. I, I, the benefits weren't great. But now here I am giving an invited talk, so, you know. Uh, of course, I did my PhD with John. It was called Reliable Computing at the Nanoscale. Uh, you heard a, a really nice uh, taste of the kinds of things John was, and I were thinking about in the last talk, having to model these emerging nanoscale uh, technologies. Um, John was always incredibly encouraging and supportive as an advisor, and uh, in my sixth year, he let me know in no certain terms that it was time to finish. And so, <laughs> thanks, John, for that. It was, it was a great time. And, and since then, I've, I've gone on to do a bunch of stuff, but specifically Body Labs. We're working on uh, what we like to refer to as human-aware computer vision, powered by the world's most statistically accurate model of the human body. So, so models for my PhD, a different kind of model going forward. Kind of a big gap, I think, in fields between a nanoscale uh, stochastic assembly and modeling the human body. But of course, uh, after my PhD, uh, John uh, also changed fields. He went on to do cybersecurity, uh, the Jefferson Fellow in the State Department. Uh, clearly, throughout his career, he's had this fluidity to change areas and learn about a new area. Nanotechnology was, as uh, Andre explained, relatively new to, to him and me, uh, certainly when I came to do the PhD. Um, so, so he taught me well. I mean, I, I went on and, and switched things up quite a bit. I, the irony, though, was that the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, where I was, was actually trying to literally bridge the gap that kind of I was with my career. Now, I was in the Tübingen campus, which is uh, down, down in the south of, of Germany there, and they were working on robotics and um, computer vision and machine learning, the kind of things you typically might think about of AI intelligent systems. And then up in Stuttgart, uh, they were transitioning this Institute for Metals Research to be part of the, of the institute as well. It was a new institute. And looking at uh, intelligent uh, uh, micro-robotics and intelligent materials and stochastic assembly, really the kind of stuff that I had been thinking about before. So the joke going in was that I was going to be the poster child for the university there. But I didn't really end up learning German or, or committing to the, the Stuttgart portion. I did go up and give some talks at some point. They mostly asked about my old research, but, but I was still flattered. Uh, <laughs> I, before continuing, I, I wanted to do a little bit of an interlude. Uh, you know, John, of course, was one of the co-founders of the department. Uh, you know, when you're young and you show up somewhere, you kind of feel like it's always been there. And sometimes your advisor may tell you stories about, you know, how things used to be forming the department early days, bits and pieces about university government administrative stuff. And you think, John, this is nice to hear, but we should really be focusing on research here. <laughs> Let's get back to business. Then meanwhile, I leave Brown, I change fields, but one thing that I absolutely did twice was be part of a of a department and organization forming from scratch. The Max Planck Institute, Max, uh, Michael Black, whom I went with, was one of the founding directors. I saw that grow from a, a couple of us in a room to a, 
a thriving department, nothing on the scale of what we have here, but still really amazing, and Body Labs as well. I, I had the opportunity to help grow that myself, and when you see that happening firsthand, boy, you realize how much can go wrong in the early days of a department. And forget about going from zero to 60, just going from zero to 15 feels like an achievement, and, and, and you guys did an outstanding job here, so I, I just really appreciated that after having left. But, but back to Max Planck, so I, I, I focused on the computer vision, but I did always love the vision for the institute, and it still is the vision for the institute, which is focusing on this idea of intelligence across scales. Uh, at the very, at the material level, at the micro level, at the human scale, from haptics to robotics to stochastic assembly. They're really trying to take all that and start thinking about these physical systems in terms of intelligent systems. And when you do that, uh, you know, you need to start to abstract away the physics and really start to think in terms of computation. And, and that's so much of what computer science is about, models of computation, and it's so much about what John's career is about. Uh, and it's really something I took away in spades working with him. I was a TA with him in CS51, a head TA, um, and the fluidity with which he changed, uh, changed topics, changed models, took on nano computation has really emboldened me in my career. Um, in computation, as we've seen in the talks that have been presented today, there's always been a need to update the models, revisit old assumptions, uh, look at how the hardware is changing and how that introduced challenges for the theorists and the practitioners alike, going from circuits to Turing machines to VLSI to parallel computing to nanoscale. I mean, that's basically the trajectory of the talks we've heard today. Uh, and, and, and we've sort of seen the same thing in other areas. So I'll talk now about modeling humans, a, a different challenge, but again, just something that I was prepared for so well in working with John to take on these new areas. So. Uh, when, when I talk about what I do with respect to intelligent systems, AI, a lot of times there is a bit of a question, and, and Michael gets this as well, why bodies? Why be so fixated on the human body? Intelligence people often think about as the brain, right? Like, the body is just a bag of bones, right? Well, we don't see it that way. And, and in fact, if you're trying to build a computer that and understands the world, you really want it to understand our world, and you want it to understand what we are going to show that computer. And, and what are we going to show a computer? Well, every year, Google releases one of these flashy marketing videos of Google Zeitgeist, what people are searching for in 2015. I, I didn't go to 2016. That wasn't a great year. But 2015, uh, you can see, and every year's the same, it's always people. It's, it's the expressiveness of the images hinges so much on understanding the human body. You know, you can teach a computer about, about basics of light and geometry, but to make sense of this, of, of the richness of what you're seeing, something that resonates with all of us, you really need the computer to understand not just about objects and, 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 and lighting, but about bodies, and in great detail, right? I mean, the expressiveness of the face, the richness of human pose and interaction, emotion, all of that is still such a challenge for computers to understand. And, and we believe it's a fundamental building block of, of, of AI, but just of computer vision. Without understanding bodies, it, it's really difficult to understand the world. And, and so what do you need to do to understand uh, bodies? Well, you need strong models. And so we put a lot of effort into making the best models we can of the human body. Um, of course, modeling the body is a millennia old effort, if you think in the broader context of art and science. But in computer vision, uh, where I live now, it, there's still a clear trajectory of moving from stick figures to uh, rig models of the body, skeleton-based models that have capsules to represent the volume of the human form to much more realistic full 3D meshes that are learned from real world data that understand the statistics of human pose and shape and how humans vary across the population. And then there's all kinds of other additions of the dynamics of the body, the appearance of the body, hair, hands, faces. It's been, a, it's been an ongoing effort. In, in our world, uh, it's crucial to learn the model from data precisely because the human body is not something that is, is, is human engineered. I mean, humans make other humans, but not in the way we make computers. Uh, and, and so to understand that, we need to capture humans accurately. So we use 
thousands of 3D scans, and, and then we fit them with a common template so that we could do the kinds of statistical analysis that allow you to build accurate models. Uh, just touching on how we do that, we typically think of a body as uh, a, a series of parts. The parts can all rotate freely, and what we want to do is bring a common template mesh into point-to-point -to -point correspondence across a collection of 3D scans. Uh, the 3D scans, uh, when properly aligned, that's what we refer to when the template has been morphed to fit the surface of the mesh, when properly aligned, they're in point-to-point -point correspondence. So point 857 on the template might lie right here on the leg across thousands of scans, and point 52 might land right on the center of the cheek across thousands of scans. And at that point, you can start to interpolate and extrapolate of how the body shape changes as, the, as a person moves their parts and how it varies across a population. Um, I don't want to go into the mathematical detail of different models we've worked with, but I, but I did want to highlight scape and simple as two formulations of how to model the shape and pose variation of the human body. Um, scape was introduced by Drago Angola at Stanford uh, and it appeared in SIGGRAPH and then simple was uh, thought up by my colleagues at MPI slightly after I left and my current colleague as well, Matt Loper, uh, who went to Brown, played a, a big part in formulating that. Uh, the idea, uh, I, I mentioned this because it speaks to the ongoing theme of rethinking re, uh, your assumptions and, and, and not taking anything for granted. And, and Matt was able to come up with a much simpler formulation of how to model the body that was faster and more graphics friendly and, and just turned out to work really nicely for what we wanted to do. Uh, to give you a little bit of a peek under the hood of the simple model, it starts with a template, a rig with a skeleton, those dots represent the joints. Because of all the data, we learn a principal component analysis of body shape. So those are the principal dimensions along which shape varies across the population. You can basically capture any body shape approximately with a relatively few number of degrees of freedom. And you can learn statistically how the joint positions move with the body shape. These aren't, of course, real world joints, but they're the joints of the model that move and rotate as the person changes pose. And then on top of the shape, you have what we refer to as corrective blend shapes, which as the model changes shape, morph the template mesh so that it can compensate for the mathematics of how it changes pose to become very realistic. And so you can see as the joints move and bend in extreme ways, you're getting very realistic deformations of elbows and knees. And these are things that if you try to handcraft this type of model across a range of shapes, it's very challenging. And, and it, it's, it takes an animator a lot of work just to do it once, uh, to say nothing of having something that works across the population. Um, I wanted to just give a taste of what you can do with a body model, an accurate model. As with any model, good models allow you to make strong inferences. And in this case, we're looking at how a body model, a 3D model of the body, can fit the pose and shape of 3D motion capture data. So 3D motion capture data, typically used in Hollywood and graphics, is 3D positions of markers put on the body. And they're typically fit with a skeleton. And then the skeleton is turned into a model. But that's a very artificial formulation of the problem. What's really going on is the human body has a surface. And each marker is on the surface at a particular location on the body. And with the simple model, uh, understanding the statistics of pose and shape, you can actually solve the problem in a very principled way, which is to estimate the position of each marker on the body. All you see are the 3D markers, but underneath there's a body, and you can estimate the shape and position of each marker on the body. And if you do that well, you can then fit the model very nicely to that raw data, estimating not just pose, but the actual body shapes of the individuals just from the marker. So these people were, these shapes come just from the 3D marker data. And then once you do this, you can get a very nice collection of, of human poses because you can get a lot of motion capture data. The Carnegie Mellon MoCap database being one example. So this was sort of a, a very nice success story for Simple. And, and it shows the kind of inference you can do with a powerful model. Um, I should note that humans are quite good at this. Uh, this is some early uh, perceptual work done in, in, in 1971 when it was much more of a challenge to make this type of video. And they did these very nice uh, capture of 
of lights, of, of point light sources on the human body so they could show this to people. And of course you can see clear as day that this is a person walking and doing these various motions despite the incredible sparse amount of data. And you're seeing this not with 3D markers, but 2D. You're just seeing these as dots on a screen. And yes, it's very clear what's happening because you in your mind have a strong model of what bodies are. I mean, you literally are a body, so it's important that you understand that. Uh, these days, I'm thrilled to see, com say, computers are finally catching up. So at Body Labs, building on other work done at Max Planck, you can now uh, train a, a convolutional neural network, many people have demonstrated this, to detect uh, various 2D landmarks on the body. They could be joint positions, facial landmarks. There's different opportunities to capture different points in an image. But then you can literally solve for the most likely shape and pose that fits that data. And it, with a little bit of temporal smoothing, you can do quite a nice job cancer, capturing the 3D geometry of this dance sequence uh, over time just from a single video. And I mean, this is not just based on work we've done, but it really shows the progress that computer vision has, has had in the last uh, five, three or five years uh, in those small uh, thanks to models. So, Bit of a whirlwind overview of, of what I've been up to. I wanted to highlight maybe some future work, some need for future models. Uh, one of those I think that is gonna be really interesting in the next decade is modeling motion. As we have the ability to capture motion with an accuracy and fidelity we've never had before, you start to want to move beyond per frame pose and start to think of movement much more as you would think of language where there's a hierarchy of meaning. I'm not just doing things randomly right now at each uh, time step. I'm doing gestures which are combined into actions which accomplish things like I want to walk and leave or I want to turn on the computer. Uh, so it's, it's quite an interesting domain I think that, that we'll start to see as, as language and movement uh, start to get combined. Um, so, so with that, I, I, I do want to conclude by saying that, that no talk on, uh, on, on, on human models would be complete without talking about <laughs> model human. <laughs> if you're very lucky, uh, your, your PhD advisor is a role model to you, and I was lucky. Uh, I wanted to just highlight a few things from John without embarrassing too much. I mean, he always, why get a PhD? Why are we doing this? I mean, he always told me a PhD should not be viewed as an accolade. It should be viewed as a ticket to do research. And that's what he did with his PhD, and it's what I've tried to do with mine. Uh, when it comes to making progress in research, uh, he, he, he relayed to me a, a, a quote, which I think actually may have came out of a conversation with Stan, which I've told other people, which is, research is mostly frustrating. Because if you're trying to solve hard problems, well, it's hard to solve hard problems. Uh, and, and, and everyone, you know, you can sit in a room and hope for flashes of brilliance or eureka moments, but that's not really how work gets done. Uh, you need to make progress each day, and slow incremental progress can turn into great, great bounds. And that's what John's done with his career, and again, it's what I'm trying to do with mine. Uh, I, again, the importance of changing fields or the ability to change fields and not get locked in and to really be willing to throw out the old when necessary and adapt what you've learned to new problems. I mean, that is so fundamental to John and, and it served me very well. Uh, finally, just sort of the importance of a routine. I mean, when you're, when you're a PhD student with someone, you spend many, many hours with them over many years and you see, you know, everyone can have moments of greatness in their life, and John's had his fair share of his, but, but real life is about the in-between. And, and 50 years at Brown, I mean, that's a lot of in-between. And to me, that is where John nails it. Uh, you know, not just in his work, but in the work he's done for all of Brown, his family life, he, the advising he's done with students. I, two people at Bot, we have about eight people from Brown at our company. In addition to me, two people went up to me when they heard I was giving this talk and said, you know, John really helped me during my time. I told you, Thea gave me a card to give to you. I gotta remember, Tyler went out of his way to say, you know, he was having some tough times at Brown and John really helped me get through it. So, you know, that kind of stuff, it's just day in, day out, the way John lives his life and carries himself through his work is, is a true inspiration. Now, John, we're celebrating 50 years at Brown. I bailed out after a mere 11. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that I will be spending 50 years at Brown, but what I can honestly say is that in 19, 
I mean, in 2061, 50 years after Legion Brown, I can only hope that I can look back and think not of the 50 years I spent in the Brown CS department, but in the 50 years I will have spent taking the Brown CS department to everywhere I, I have been and to represent as an ambassador for this great department and for John Savage. Because if I can do that, I'll know I'll have had a very successful career. So here's to 50 years of